Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Rick, welcome to the show. Yeah, hi, Ryan. Nice to join you. When someone asks you, what do you do? What do you typically respond? How do you respond to that question? Well, my role at Patagonia has uh, changed over the years, uh, and it actually goes back to the beginning of the company uh, as one of Yvonne Chouinard's, the founder of Patagonia's climbing partners. He and I have been uh, not just mountaineering partners, but really close friends uh, for probably longer than either either of us care to consider right now. Uh, it's going into the many, many decades. But I, uh, in the beginning of the company, worked uh, in support of the effort as a as a consultant um, or a contractor, I suppose, assisting with marketing efforts. Um, I did that for a, a number of years. Uh, I was a photographer and filmmaker back in the day and uh, supported the company's uh, marketing, creating what are now called assets, and then had the um, probably unusual uh, progression, although in the context of Patagonia, it's such quirky business, it seems completely normal to me. I then was invited to join the board of directors, and I was on the board for a while, and an opening came up. Uh, the company needed somebody to oversee all of its environmental initiatives, which are really the reason we're in business, which I can speak about in a moment. And so 12 years ago, I went off the board and became an employee. Uh, first job I've ever had in my life. I've always been self-employed up until then, and my wife leaned on me to uh, finally try this uh, work thing where you get a regular paycheck. And it's been wonderful. Uh, it's been just such a um, <clears throat> an unusual opportunity not to work for a company and be an employee, but to really work for what essentially is as close to a not-for-profit organization as a for-profit company can probably ever be. It is uh, a privilege, not a job. Fantastic. It's interesting to hear uh, that your wife was one of the main people who made you get a job. I, <laughs> I can I can resonate with that. Uh, My wife uh, also worked here for 20 years, uh, co-founding the marketing department, and uh, she's been involved in some many of the other uh, initiatives of the company that really created value in addition to our uh, dedication to using the company for environmental protection. We're also leaders in uh, the way we support our employees through uh, our daycare center, for example, and the other uh, support we give uh, to a whole working environment where the company really it makes an effort to meld together uh, our employees' personal lives with our work lives. That's actually a goal, uh, even though it m m might sound like something you want to avoid. It's something that we try and do so that we seamlessly, as close as seamlessly as we can, support our, our, our employees' full lives here. So she's really integral in uh, working with Yvonne's wife, Melinda, to realize a, a lot of those programs. But the, the, the mission of the company you know, is uh, stated clearly to build the best product we can to do that, causing no unnecessary harm, and then finally to use the success of our business to implement solutions to the environmental crisis. And that's a, a long and complex mission, but it's a it's a complex challenge. And this company is in business to realize that mission, and in particular, as the last part says, to find solutions to the environmental crisis. And it's probably um, a question that would come to many of your listeners' minds as to, you know, where does that come from? Why, why does the company exist not to make its uh, shareholders uh, wealthy, but rather to use the wealth that it, that it creates to, again, be an agent for our environmental protection? And the answer goes back to um, my initial acquaintance, the way I, I know Yvonne originally, which is, again, as I said through – uh, climbing and mountaineering, and and as climbers, and especially as climbers that were out in the in the wild parts of the world, um, where we saw uh, firsthand and learned uh, and got into our bones what what wildness really is. Then, as we saw that wildness degrade right in front of our eyes over our own lifetimes, as we've 
witnessed uh, the glaciers we once climbed literally melt away and many of the wild places that we loved as uh, young as in our younger years uh, disappear as uh, human development has encroached increasingly on those wild places. You know, as now with climate change, we've seen uh, habitats literally shift from under the feet of wildlife and and move away uh, so that or shift so that you know they're so the biodiversity is threatened. It, we've seen these things in our own lifetime with our own eyes. So that's where our commitment comes from. It's really rooted in in that, in our love for wild places and consequently our commitment to use the company to uh, protect them. But, uh, you know, in addition, we extend that to other areas of uh, environmental protection. Uh, the mission, again, going back to that, going back to that statement is, as I said, to build the best product, but do it causing no unnecessary harm. And that no unnecessary harm part is the what is frequently now called the sustainability commitments. And so we are we go uh, wide and deep into that uh, area as well. You know, it's it's interesting because I, I, <clears throat> I, I remember Yvonne saying <clears throat> at some point that uh, the clothing part of Patagonia was actually designed to be an irresponsible business to support your climbing business. Can you talk a little bit about the the sort of climbing piece and how the the irresponsible company turned into be your your main driver of change? Yeah, um, you know he he sometimes says that he's a reluctant businessman and he only got into business to support his climbing habit habit and his and his surfing habit. And um, you know I uh, many of us here uh, are the same in in that regard. Um, I became a photographer and, and filmmaker, and then and then and then finally a marketing consultant, and finally an employee of a company. Uh, you know, primarily originally to support my climbing habit and my uh, habit and my adventure habit, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> so that was our our motivation. Uh, but then, as I said, as we, as I, I suppose, as we you know, inevitably mature. Well, maybe not inevitably, but but most of us did, and as as adventures, we we again saw the degradation going on around us. Then it became much more than just some way to support our habit, as it were. And it really became the way we, as individuals, could use our our time on this planet to try to provide solutions to make a difference. And and that really became the reason we're we're in business, as I as I said. So it's been a shift uh, over the over the decades. Uh, but because uh, Yvonne has really decided to keep the company and again, to use it as a tool for environmental uh, protection, I think we've become a, an interesting model for how business can contribute to uh, to environmental protection. As our mission says, you know, providing, we hope, uh, solutions to the crisis that we all face. And, and I might say going back Back to that mission again, we very carefully chose every single word in that mission, and we very purposefully chose to use the word environmental crisis. Uh, it wasn't an environmental problem. You know, problems have solutions. This is a, a predicament, a pre and predicaments don't necessarily have solutions, uh, at least not yet. And, uh, you know, a predicament and a, and a crisis is indeed exactly what we think we're in right now. You know, I've, I've always wondered with Patagonia, you're so strong on environmental issues. Um, did you ever, was the mission ever thought about, you know, solve the social and environmental challenges or, you know, like what, how does social or community based uh, improvement fa factor into Patagonia's mission? Well, uh, we have thought long and, and deep and wide about that. And we've concluded that when you, uh, go through the exercise of um, digging down into any social justice issue far enough uh, to find the cause of the problem that more often than not those causes have uh, some root in environmental issues, especially environmental degradation. I mean, even something like the AIDS crisis uh, or the Zika uh, crisis going on right now. If you uh, look back into those issues far enough, you'll you'll discover some environmental degradation that has uh, upset the uh, regular balance in an ecosystem that has uh, unleashed viruses. 
And consequently, we think that if we're really in the business of of finding uh, solutions to the cause of these causes of the environmental crisis, that uh, focusing on environmental degradation is probably the best place for us to use our resources. Now, having said that, we also find it very interesting and fascinating, I would even add, that um, in the last decade, the uh, um, the uh, emerging generation, the, the the millennials, don't really separate social justice from environmental impact issues nearly as much as those uh, of us in the older generations uh, are in the habit of doing. For for them, it's it's one and the same, and and that actually goes back and links to the way we viewed it all along over the last forty some years. So we're fascinated in this consideration that social justice and environmental degradation are just two sides of the same coin in the sense that they both have at their roots uh, the same uh, source and causes instead of just symptoms of the issues we're all facing. So we do address social justice issues, but often we do it through our commitments to environmental protection. Now, occasionally, uh, in our efforts to cause no unnecessary harm, uh, again, realizing our, our mission, we do discover that there are uh, pro- social justice problems in our supply chain, especially where um, we've got to address them specifically. I mean, a good example of that would be uh, a recent discovery that uh, amongst our tier two and three suppliers, which in apparel are mills and dye houses in Taiwan, were using uh, effectively uh, slaves uh, in their companies where they were bringing in workers from South Asia and Southeast Asia, confiscating their passports, um, essentially holding them hostage until they earned back the cost of their transportation and uh, their upkeep. Uh, and, and often it would take uh, three to five years for them to win back their passports. Well, effectively, that's slave labor. That's keeping people uh, indentured against uh, their own wishes often. And um, when we discovered that, we worked with the Taiwanese government, we worked with the NGOs, we worked with the companies, we worked with multi-stakeholders to uh, find a solution to that. We went public with it. Um, uh, as an as a, as a added driver, and we did uh, we are in the process now of, uh, of finding solutions to that with many of the companies reversing their policies, eliminating the middle people that were responsible for confiscating confiscating the passports, and and uh, the the problems are are uh, decreasing right right now. So we do address these things, but in the main we apply our resources to uh, environmental protections for the reasons I just described. You know, I I asked um, Rose Marcario this question and Phil Graves on on a previous podcast. And, you know, it's Patagonia is such a leader. It's so far ahead of the the average or even the above average companies that there's a sort of dichotomy where, um, you know, you're doing so many things and yet, I guess one question I have is, is making incremental changes to the garment industry or, you know, the thing, the improvements that you're making, do you feel like it's enough to really uh, truly address the climate crisis or, or well, Pat- yeah. Patagonia is a small company. Yeah. Um, you know, we were under a billion dollars in sales. A billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, but in the global economy, it, it's a drop in the bucket. <clears throat> Uh, but we uh, like to think that we um, punch above our weight class, that uh, we have a, a voice uh, that's a little louder than our physical size, as it were, our monetary size. Uh, so we have we have influence and we, and we have impact, but even that's, uh, at the end of the day, often too limited. And we recognize that what's uh, often really needed is what's commonly called systems change, where you know, you really need to – what's really needed, I should say, are changes to the rules with how the global economy operates. And so we ask ourselves, well, if that's uh, often the goal, how do you go about doing that? Uh, we try to find ways forward to uh, create system change. I think the uh, our co-founding of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition would be an example of one such effort where – We, um, partnering with Walmart uh, six years ago, launched a coalition, which is 
now become the biggest trade organization in the apparel and footwear industries in the world. And uh, the goals of this coalition are to create a transparent and um, robust tools to measure both the environmental impacts and the uh, social uh, justice uh, achievements in uh, apparel and footwear uh, globally, and then to use uh, those measurements to really influence governments to change the rules. That's the strategy we've adopted in this coalition. And, uh, you know, as I said, we're a little over five years into it, but we're taking ground. We've uh, completed many of the measurement tools, and, and it's, a, it's a suite of tools. It has to be. There's different tools for different for measuring different parts of our impacts in the industry. Uh, and now those uh, with those measurements, we're creating benchmarks so all the member companies can assess their uh, position uh, against uh, industry averages. Uh, and then we're in the process now of implementing a, a roadmap towards transparency where all these measurements will be publicly available. And we hope at that point they'll really unleash uh, drivers that uh, will create change in the entire apparel and footwear system. You know, that's that's the theory and that's, and that's the hope. So we probably got another uh, two to three to four years before we reach the, the larger and higher level goals of the effort, but we're getting there. Um, we are. Uh, we do have a seat at the table uh, in uh, government-led discussions about changing the rules, uh, especially in the EU. So it's an example of how uh, a little small company like this can uh, use its influence to, in this case, uh, rally the whole industry behind an effort to create uh, an entire uh, global change in the rules of the game. I hope we pull it off. Of course, uh, it's uh, still it's a, still a hypothesis that hasn't proven itself, but it's well on the way to achieving that goal. I guess a follow-on question would be: Are you uh, optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the planet? I uh, I I know that Yvonne is he likes to call himself a what is it like a doom a doom bat about the future but what what about you are you optimistic or pessimistic about our chances well when i'm asked that question um i sometimes refer to my friend david Quammen, who's a you know well known outdoor writer and david famously said one time that the the trouble with despair as a response is that not only is it useless it's also not very much fun and uh certainly with my own limited time on earth as we all have <laughs> i want to enjoy it as much as i can and Sinking into um, despair uh, and seeing only the only darkness on the horizon line is not very much fun. Uh, but I also, tr- but I also am a, am a, am a realist. So uh, certainly I'm susceptible to dropping into depressive funks when I consider the the direction that we're going. When I consider the, if nothing more than the than the measurements that we use to uh, – the, the numbers we use to measure the health of our planet. I mean, if you look at those, uh, it's pretty depressing. Uh, just consider the graph of the global increase in temperatures and atmospheric CO2 and deforestation and desertification, the increases in ocean acidification and – water eutrophication and and most alarmingly for me and, and and the saddest of all is the decrease in the biodiversity of our planet that you add all those things together and you get into a funk pretty quickly but uh that's not getting anything that's not making any change at all in fact it's getting in the way of change and uh so we're doing our very best in the ways some of the ways that I've just described to you to you know, use our business, as I said, to try to find some solutions to this. And um, I said earlier that our our mission is to make the the best product we can with no unnecessary harm. At least that's the first two parts of it. And that no unnecessary harm is an interesting topic to look at in the context of your question because it, um, first of all, it's an interesting construction of a phrase 
by using a double negative, if you make it grammatically correct, you left with the fact that you're causing harm, which is our definition of sustainability, <clears throat> the recognition that manufacturing any consumer good the way it's done right now is causing harm. Uh, and that informs every all of our thinking here at Patagonia, and it, and it also un, underlies our commitment to um, our philanthropy and to use our business as an agent for uh, creating environmental solutions. We, By recognizing we're doing harm, we also – recognize that uh, from a moral perspective alone, uh, we're obligated to uh, give back. You know, that's where our philanthropy comes from. Uh, but still, at the end of the day, we're recognizing that all we're doing is causing no unnecessary harm. We're doing less bad. But in the last couple, three years, especially as we've got into the food business, we're starting to identify uh, uh, new ways of do, doing things. And in your preamble to your podcast, Ryan, you said that uh, you're exploring uh, I, regenerative ideas. And regenerative ideas is, is really increasingly large on our radar screen. Uh, and we think of regenerative uh, ways of doing business as as the, the solutions that instead of causing less bad could actually cause more good. So that in do, instead of doing no unnecessary harm, as our mission says, maybe we could figure out how to create products that actually offer solutions. And so instead of doing less bad, they do more good. And the product, the food products we're making, and and we're also exploring the possibility of making more apparel products from natural fibers that that use regenerative uh, farming and, and grazing practices to produce the um, ingredients. <clears throat> You know, in the case of our parallel, that uh, is, uh, would be true of, of cotton and, and wool. You know, there are ways of raising sheep on the land that improve the soil quality of the grasslands. Uh, and as that soil quality improves, uh, you know, a couple big things happen. Uh, one is that the soils retain more moisture. So as we become, as we enter an era of increased water scarcity, <clears throat> that's a, a, a big uh, potential uh, solution to that issue. <clears throat> the bigger thing to us that happens, though, with uh, increased soil health from uh, following what are called rotational grazing practices is that over time those soils begin to pull carbon out of the air and store it in the ground just as, they, just as the soil did before we human beings came along with our grazing animals. <clears throat> uh, but naturally, uh, grasslands were grazed by herds of animals that would move over them and uh, eat down the grass quickly, uh, just as migrating bison or wildebeest in Africa do, and then they move on, and the grasses regenerate quite quickly, and then uh, be and then and then the cycle of migratory animals over those grasses over time support uh, healthy grasslands that build these healthy soils that increase the organic matter in the soil, uh, both dead and 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 living organisms in the soil, and of course. Um, organic matter is made from carbon, and that's why the soils pull the carbon out of the air and into the ground as they increase in health. So getting those soils back to the health uh, that they had before we human beings came along is a, is a really interesting uh, potential solution or partial solution to climate change. The amount of carbon that can theoretically be pulled out of the ground and uh, or out of the air and into the ground is, is potentially enormous because there's been enough – test ranches and farms using these protocols now around the world in different soil types in various climates that uh, it is uh, increasingly – with increasing accurate, accuracy uh, – uh, 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 with increasing accuracy, scientists can extrapolate the test farms and ranches uh, to get an idea of how much carbon could be pulled in the ground if this idea really scaled. And the projections are astonishing. Uh, they're, um, you know, somewhere between uh, 20 and 50 percent, depending on the uh, algorithms that scientists use. But uh, somewhere in, in, in that scoping, uh, if you converted enough farmland and gra grazing land in the world to these protocols, you could pull enough carbon out of the air to get us back to uh, pre-industrial carbon levels. We'd be at about uh, most of those projections would pull us back to about 290, 295 parts per million, which is where we were in the uh, middle of the 18th century. So there are emerging ideas coming out right now 
that, um, and here's the answer to your question, quite of a long one, but these, these things uh, are a glimmer of hope that really, really underpins uh, my personal optimism. And I even see Doom Bad Yvonne getting a smile on his face when he thinks about these things. And, and I've actually heard him say, you know, maybe there are solutions out there to get us uh, out of the, uh, away from that cliff that he felt we were inevitably headed towards. You gave me a big smile with that comment about Yvonne. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm 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 really glad to hear. It's very affirming to hear you talk about soil health and regenerative ag. Because uh, at Lift Economy, we've been particularly excited about the Marin Carbon Project. And uh, are there particular individuals or organizations or farms that you are looking to that are leading in this area or working with that can sort of be that I could point my listeners towards? Yeah, we work with quite a few individuals. Um, Fred Kirschenbaum is one of my uh, buddies and friends out of uh, Iowa, North Dakota, and, and he's done a, a lot of um, leading work with the Aldo Leopold Institute at the University of Iowa and Iowa State. Uh, there's a wonderful um, little NGO that just started up with the really catchy name Carbon Underground, uh, and they're uh, committed to being a uh, clearinghouse for uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and grazing ideas. Uh, and they've um, and you and your listeners could check them out. There's also a, a little NGO out of LA that's run by some millennials that were in the music and restaurant business and got onto uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and got so fascinated with it that they, now use part of their personal times and resources to try and advance uh, the whole effort as well. It's, it's, they're, they're a great little group of people, and they, they call themselves Kiss the Ground. And if you uh, check out their website, you can also find a little video that they've created that really summarizes the whole thing most succinctly of anything I've seen in about a four- or five-minute clip. Very, and is Patagonia starting to – grow sort of, I guess, climate beneficial or net positive clothing? Is that something you're working we're looking on? In, we're looking into that. That's definitely something that we're um, considering. We're doing, we've got people researching it right now. Yeah. Yep. So the answer is yes. Not Well, the answer is that we haven't got there yet, but we're working uh, towards that and making it very, it's a very interesting uh, opportunity for us. So where do, where do you see where do you see Patagonia heading? Because I've I've heard Yvonne um, allude to the food side of Patagonia may eventually be larger than the clothing side. D do you see um, Patagonia moving more, more st st strongly towards the food piece, or, or where do you see the next sort of twenty five years the company? How do you see it evolving? Well, um, you know, I'll make I'll answer it by uh, first saying that. Uh, human beings are really poor at predicting the future, and we're probably pretty poor at predicting our own future. And I, I would say most companies probably aren't too good at that. Uh, but especially a company like this that uh, enjoys uh, discovering new opportunities and taking a winger on them. Uh, and uh, food, though, our commitment to food is, is no longer a winger. <laughs> it is a is a serious commitment that we're in for the long term. And uh, Yvonne's projection that uh, that effort could eclipse our apparel business uh, at some point out there in the horizon line is entirely possible. But, you know, it, the truthful answer is uh, it's probably impossible to predict with, with any sort of accuracy. Um, but it's certainly possible. And also, uh, you've interviewed my colleague, Phil Graves, who runs our uh, investment fund that we call 20 million and change. Although now it's, I think it's got a, a bigger portfolio and probably we're way north of 20 million. But uh, w with that fund, we're investing in startups, <clears throat> existing companies also that are uh, that have interesting business models uh, aligned with our own goals. Uh, and and uh, it's in and and I think that. Uh, through those investments, it's entirely possible that we could get increasingly involved in some of these other companies and, and go down different paths and avenues with them uh, that we can't even foresee right now. So it's all pretty exciting. Uh, one thing that I think will be consistent through Patagonia's future, though, uh, with food, uh, with any of the startups and $20 million and change, and certainly with the apparel business that we've got up and running right now, 
is that all of these businesses uh, will operate under the same mission. You know, and, and again, we're absolutely committed to making the best product we can. That has a, a big environmental component, uh, which may not be self-evident, but we recognize that when you build the best when you build the best product, you're also building the most durable product you can, and that durability becomes one of the main components of any product's environmental footprint, and it becomes the most important component in reducing that footprint over time because the longer a product is serviceable, uh, the lower its uh, impact on the planet uh, is, and that really hockey sticks as a product extends its life at into 5, 10, and 20 years. That's why we're committed to the best product, and as I said before, making it with no unnecessary harm and then using the businesses to help find solutions to the environmental crisis. Everything we do in apparel, the food company, and probably uh, anything we get deeply involved in through our investment fund is going to operate with that same mission. So that will be consistent, uh, and uh, that is one of the models uh, for uh, one of the business models that uh, we really hope uh, take root just outside of our walls and inspire other businesses to adopt similar missions. Uh, and use themselves uh, to create more solutions than they do problems. How can the listeners help you and Patagonia, uh, you know, obviously not buying a bunch of jackets they don't need from you, but um, what what sort of support uh, do you need to sort of help you advance and grow the next economy? Well, uh you know, the support that your listeners could offer us is, is actually the one that you just mentioned, which is to take us up on our um, request to, to not buy more than than you need. Uh, as we have analyzed the global crisis, uh, you know, we and, and followed the macroeconomists who uh, more professionally analyze trends, we can see that the uh, global increase in population, uh, and more importantly, uh, the increase in um, affluence of that population, uh, the increase in its consumption of goods and resources, good, uh, goods and services on the planet, uh, is the um, the reason that uh, all those indicators of the planet's health that I listed earlier are continuing to go in the, in the wrong direction. And going back to my comment about regenerative agriculture and, and grazing offer offering a solution, we do absolutely believe that they do, that they will. But we also believe it's going to require an all of the above strategy. That you can't have one magic bullet that fixes everything. You know, we're all going to have to continue to develop uh, sustainability innovations that reduce the footprints of our products. Uh, we're all going to have to uh, manage our supply chains uh, for oh, no unnecessary harm, as we do. Uh, we're going to have to advance uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and grazing, but it's just one thing in a suite of uh, solutions. And we're also going to add to that, have to add to that suite, the idea that we all need to reduce our consumption. Uh, we believe that that's going to be essential moving forward. And so we ask our, our customers to really think about that, and I would ask your listeners to do the same thing. And your listeners are probably wondering how we can do that and continue to grow as a, as a company. And it goes back to that – the answer goes back to that mission of making the best product with no unnecessary harm because we believe that if we do that and we make a product that that anybody listening to this can, can use for, for – five and 10 and 20 years, and we help you fix it if it's broken and put it in the new hands if you're not using it anymore and recycle it when it's truly worn out, then if we do all those things together, we're creating more solutions than we are problems because we're, we're creating responsible products that allow you, the listeners, to live responsibly, and that's a partnership that we want with you. And if we can also encourage you to not buy more than you need, then we're compounding the solutions that we're creating. So that 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 would be our request. And we know we're not perfect at this. I mean, you go into one of our stores and there's all this stuff that's attractive, it's made in different colors, it makes you want to buy more of it. And so we're guilt. You know, we're part of that problem as well, but we're trying to do our best to manage that impact. And so this idea of buying less and only buying what you need is 
it, it's a it's an important consideration. And then listeners might be asking, well, you know, how do you how do you if you succeed as a business because uh, more people support you for uh, buying a jacket when they do need it, what's going to happen to all the other people that are making jackets that, that we're not going to buy? And and that's an interesting question, uh, and it doesn't nobody has the answer to it right now because now you're asking yourselves what's going to happen. We're asking ourselves what will happen to the global economy if consumption starts to go down, and and that's new territory for everybody. But we do believe there's solutions there because it gets down to uh, examining you know what stuff means in our lives, and, and in fact, even more basic than that, it gets down to asking ourselves what does work mean in our lives if if we're not going to work to create more stuff to consume than we need, what are we going to do with our time? How are we going to contribute? And we really believe this idea of uh, food may be a big part of the answer to that question because regeneratively grown food requires quite a bit of input of work, but it's such fulfilling work because it's creating more solutions than it is problems and it's creating healthy food. And uh, maybe we need to, uh, a, a little bit of a return to, to that that movement. And, and if you think about it, that's almost a return to where we started before the Industrial Revolution started. So we don't see that as necessarily a bad thing, but a, a very uh, in, intriguing idea to the problem. To get back to your question, um, I think that uh, all of you listening to this uh, need to join us in reexamining our relationship to stuff, uh, to reexamining our uh, role as consumers. We hate that word of Patagonia. We we try to figure out how to replace it with some version of citizen, and we, we keep coming up short with anything that sticks. But know that we hate the word, but, we also, but also know we're asking everybody to think about it and to join us in thinking about that. And uh, to the extent that you can uh, become you know, part of our community and support us in our efforts, we'll support you because at the heart of it, we want to be in the business of, of, of producing the products more responsibly that will allow you to live more responsibly. And last question, Rick, where can folks go to learn more about your environmental initiatives and, and other things you're working on at Patagonia? We have a list of, uh, we describe many of our environmental initiatives uh, on our website at patagonia.com. And we also annually publish a booklet, uh, our environmental initiatives booklet that lists everything that we do. Uh, including all the organizations that we support through our uh, philanthropy. And there are hard copies of that uh, available in our stores often, but it's also available online at our website. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.